Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And, uh, you're one of the reasons I do this, and I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do, because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Horses. These beautiful, majestic creatures were paramount in the case of Rita Crunwell, who defrauded a small Illinois town by the name of Dixon out of millions, multi-millions, and became the largest single municipal fraud ever committed in an American small town. And a few years ago, I covered this case in depth. Well, today I'm re-imaging it and remaking it for you. Let's jot dive in to the crimes of Rita Crunwell. This one is the largest civil fraud at the municipal level, the city level, ever perpetrated in the United States of America to the tune of almost $54 million. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I got a little visitor here. This is Wild, the crime cat. Say hi. She heard me talk and decided she would crawl up here and get some good petting. So I thought I'd just introduce you to her. Love her so much. She, I inherited her as a step pet when I married my wife. And she has become my favorite. Don't tell my dogs. Please. But anyway, this is Wild the Crime Cat. Say hi, Wild. Anyway. Let's get into this crime, shall we? All right. Rita Crum Crunwell was born Rita Humphrey, January 10th, 1953, in the small town of Dixon, Illinois. Spelled D-I-X-O-N. That's actually a uh, family name of mine, so I was very interested in this case. Dixon, Illinois was the hometown of a couple of uh, well-known uh business and celebrities, politicians, namely uh, the founder of the Walgreens Corporation, was born and raised there. He started the pharmacy there, was a pharmacist. And caddying for him at the uh, local golf course was a young man by the name of Ronald Reagan, who grew up to be that actor in those Bonzo movies, and also maybe went on to be a politician. <laughs> oh, well, of course, President Reagan. Reagan, and he actually coined the phrase, trust but verify. It was his standard thing, especially during the, uh, during the arms race when he was negotiating with Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. That was his catchphrase during all those intensive discussions in 1986. In fact, Mikhail Gorbachev himself was quoted as saying he gets sick of hearing it. How Reagan told him, I trust you, but I'm going to verify. And that phrase never rang more true than if it had actually been applied to Reagan's hometown at the municipal level. But we're going to see what happens there. But Rita Humphrey, she grew up on a farm. She was the child of Caroline and Ray Humphrey, who were uh, horse farmers and cattle farmers. Uh, she, of course, took on an early interest in horses particularly the American Quarter Horse. The American Quarter Horse, I actually, uh, my dad actually had one of these on our farm when we were growing up. They are amazing horses. They are beautiful. And no, they're not just a one quarter, one fourth of a horse. They are a beautiful horse. They're called Quarter Horses because of the speed they exhibit at short distances. They have short bursts of energy which and speed, which is why they're called 
quarter horses because their speed on a quarter mile run is amazing, faster than even a thoroughbred racehorse. So that's why they're called that. They're also a remarkably versatile for farm work. They make beautiful show horses. They're just beautiful animals. So if you have an interest in horses, definitely check out American Quarter Horses. And she actually uh, grew up with a love for these horses, rode these horses, helped her dad train these horses, and absolutely uh, became an equestrian and was a, competed at a very high level. She was a very well-known rider and shower of these horses, and she started doing it professionally when she was a teenager. Rita went to the local Dixon High School, went into, was planning on going to college to major in accounting, and got into the school's work-study program, which got her a job as an intern at City Hall when she was a sophomore. And she started working there in various functions as an intern in various departments and eventually worked her way to being hired full-time as a, both a secretary to the mayor and an assistant to the controller. And while working at City Hall, she met city engineer and uh, engineering technician Jerry L. Crunwell. They married in 1974, though they would divorce in 1986. Not a hot, whole lot was known about the condition of their marriage. They had no children. We do know that. And then in 1983, Rita was appointed Comptroller and Treasurer for the city of Dixon, which was kind of unique that the Comptroller and the, the, controller and the Treasurer would be a dual position. Usually, the Comptroller is simply the head accountant. They balance the books. They write the checks. They do all of the functional activities of the of the role, financial role, or whom, whomever they're serving. Whereas a treasurer is more of a guiding office in that it takes in, the treasurer is responsible for all the intake of money, and then distributes it to the controller for actual operations, which the fact that these two offices were put together is one of the reasons that she was able to perpetrate almost a $54 million fraud against this small town. Let's get into that. Rita did an excellent job both as, uh, as an assistant and then later on as controller and treasurer for the first uh, four years, actually the first seven years of her being in office. She kept excellent books. She did everything right. She made sure the money was distributed because as treasurer, she took in all of the tax money that the city of Dixon was due. This is from property tax, income tax, sales tax. She was very careful to take in the city's cut of all those taxes, put them in the proper accounts, and then use that money to pay the city's bills. And she did an excellent job managing costs, keeping costs down, and operating the city. And she received a lot of high praise from the city council and the mayor. However, the fact that there were no separation of duties within Dixon because it was just so small, except for her job, the controller slash treasurer, like I said, normally there would be an elected or appointed official on the city council that served as treasurer. But she did both, so she had the same person taking in the money, also outputting the money. So, very dangerous situation. Remember, trust yet verify. Ronald Reagan. Her, the city clerk, city manager, which is your roads and your sanitation manager, the guy that kind of keeps the streets clean and keeps everything well cut, the fire and police chief. Those were the only full-time positions, well, as you can imagine, because the other employees, fire and police, have enough work to do on their own, and managing the various, their police force and fire departments and keeping those in line with state regulations, and then you have a city sanitation and public works manager that is very enthralled in keeping the streets the way they should be. There was really no one else overseeing Rita. She had the power of the bank pen, and she used it. The city clerk, who we will talk about, Miss Swanson, who was city clerk at the time that Rita was there, had her own uh, 
job to do and that issuing various licenses, tags, that sort of thing, that's a full-time job on its own. So you literally had very few people. And because they had very few employees, such as the only ones that would actually have people working under them at this time was the city manager, fire and police chief. They had 12 people on the road crews and sanitation crews of the city. They had about 10 police officers and about 10 firemen. And that was it. So basically the city clerk worked on her own. She might have had a few interns working with her, but for the most part she did her job herself, just like Rita did her job by herself. She didn't have an assistant. She didn't have anyone. It was just her. And for this tremendous job, she was paid $80,000 a year, which in the late 80s, early 90s, even early 2000s, that's a great salary. Heck, that's a great salary even today. I, I barely make half of that with all of my jobs combined, and I would love to make $80,000 a year. So, it's a great salary no matter what century you're in. But, she did everything. So, normally, if the treasurer had been that appointed position that it would normally be, that person would see the tax funds come in, they would distribute them into the proper accounts, and then they would monitor that money leaving the accounts as the city's bills were paid. But remember, you had the same person doing both jobs. That is a recipe for disaster. The mayor of the city was also part-time. He ran a, at the time, it was Jim Burke. He was elected mayor in uh, 2000. So he took over very shortly after Rita was in her heyday as controller. All the mayors had been part-time. They had other careers. Uh, and as well as the city council had other careers. The city councilmen and the mayors were paid somewhere around $9,500 a year for their service. So they had to go out every day and work 40, you know, eight, 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 nine hours a day at a private job and then come in and do their duties for the city. So as you can imagine, they relied very heavily on the very few full-time employees the city had to make the city work. And for a long time, it seemed to work. And then you had 1990, when all of a sudden you had Miss Crunwell demanding cut cut, cut. All of a sudden, the surplus that had been in place when she took over and had sustained the city for many, many years was gone. And they were actually in a deficit. And no one could quite figure out where this deficit came from or what was causing it. But it was very difficult to get any money for anything out of Rita. She cut the budgets of every department. She froze wages for the entire city, all the full-time employees had their benefits and salaries frozen. There was a hiring freeze, so no one could hire anyone. And actually, the city manager was forced to cut some jobs. So he went from 14 people on his crew down to six in just a couple of years and was told that he could not replace the... Uh, decaying uh, sanitation trucks, uh, mixing trucks, all the things he needed to do the work he needed to do around town. There was no money for it. He once said that in the 10 years he worked with Miss Crunwell, that entire time with rusted out trucks that were literally falling apart, they had to put plywood down in to keep the bottoms from rusting out. He got a set of new tires for one sanitation truck, and that was all he could ever get out of her. The same with the fire department. Police chief operated old vehicles, couldn't upgrade even their bulletproof vests. So this was rough. You're sending firemen and police officers into dangerous situations without proper protection. That's scary. Then enter 19, uh, 1999 2000 when Jim Burke was elected mayor of Dixon, Illinois. He uh, was kind of distressed at the condition of the city in that it had kind of fallen into disrepair. There were huge potholes occasionally. Rita would give the okay to fix some things around the city, but not often. So he was kind of in dismay, and he began trying to figure out where their surplus had gone. And every time he questioned Rita's 
work ethic or what she was doing, he was always told by the city council, well, she's audited by an outside source, an outside auditor every year. The bank sees what she does. She does a great job. And he actually went to the accounting firm of Clifton and Gunderson, who was in charge of filing the tax returns for the city, auditing their books every year, and also held the personal accounts of a lot of the city officials. He was told by their chief auditor, no one handles books and money better than Rita Cronwell. So he said he kind of sleeped out of there, feeling feeling less than a man, he said, because he had just been castrated by these people that said there's no way she's doing anything wrong. So he then went to the city council and petitioned for the auditing portion because they did everything else for the city. They also audited their books, and he said that's too much power in too few hands. Why don't we farm the auditing out to another accountant? So they basically took the auditing from Clifton Gunderson, who is a pretty large accounting firm, and also employed the services of Sam Card, who is a local accountant. Little did they know that Sam Card did a lot of contracted work for Clifton Gunderson and basically secretly and illegally handed the auditing back to Clifton Gunderson, who would do the audit. Sam would sign off on it as if he had done it himself and never take a look at it. And so we were right back to that same circle. And Rita had 15 or 16 of these audits that said she was doing the right thing. So at this point, the mayor had nothing to stand on, so he went about his business, what he was supposed to be doing. He did say he admired her work ethic. She was a very nice person that anytime he asked for something, she could put her hand on it right away. She knew where everything was. She always said, anytime he requested something, I'll get right on that boss and was just a model employee. So he kind of weighed his fears a little bit. Also at this time, city clerk Kathy Swanson was upset that her wages had been frozen, just like everyone else in town. But she admired Rita. She really uh, loved her. She was a, 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 had already been with the city 10 years herself at this, in 2000. So she considered Rita her mentor because she, Rita had already been the comptroller and treasurer when she had been hired. And Rita taught her how the city operated and basically taught her how to do her job. So because Rita had interned in that department. So everyone loved Rita. And so when she cut, cut, cut and told them no, they couldn't spend money for this, they couldn't have raises, they couldn't hire anybody, they just accepted, well, the money goes in, the money goes out. Maybe we're not collecting as much tax revenue as we once did. That was their first mistake. Because Dixon had grown. There were a lot more operating farms, businesses, restaurants, a lot more tax dollars were flowing in to this uh, city by virtue of all the various sales taxes and property taxes that were paid to the state. And then the state would pay all the cities and towns their part of that. So there was a lot more of that. And also during the time that Rita was there, the Illinois toll road had become a thing. And there was a huge stretch of that that went right through Dixon. So Dixon got a huge cut of the toll revenue as well. So there was more money than ever flowing into Dixon, but yet they were in a deficit. And it all started, I said, in 1990 as a slow descent. And by 2012, they were in dire straits. The city literally was falling into disrepair, and they couldn't figure out why. All their audits came back clean. All their books came back clean. It was a it was a genuine mystery. But let me tell you what happened. Because of the separation of because of the lack of separation of duties, she did everything as treasurer. She took in all this new tax revenue, all this new toll revenue. She put it into the various bank accounts that the city operated, and she paid the bills. She also created a new account in 1990, specifically December 8th, 1990, is when this scandal really took hold. She started at Fifth Third Bank, which is a nice regional chain that's in a lot of states, Midwest and Southeast mostly. 
Fifth Third Bank handled all the all of the accounts, so all of it was under the the watchful eye of this one bank, and all of those accounts had one signer, Rita Crunwell. And she, so no one questioned her when she walked down to the local branch of Fifth Third Bank and opened a brand new account, calling it the Reserve Sewer Capital Development Account. Basically, your basic slush fund, which is just a middle fund where money comes in and immediately goes out because it's for a specific purpose. It's an account that was created to pay a certain type of bill so the money doesn't sit there for long like it would in a regular checking or savings account. So no one really questioned it when she opened this account. And because it was a slush account for paying quick bills, no one questioned when she would transfer either online, this is in the early days of online, or by telephone or in person, no one would question when she would transfer money from the various other city accounts into this account and then the money would leave immediately. No one questioned it. So basically what Rita would do is transfer, $180,000 was her first transfer into that account. She then created an invoice for a road job or a sewer job that never happened, never took place from either the state of Illinois or a private contractor complete with logos and all that stuff. She would create a fake invoice, file the invoice away, and then pay the fake invoice from the slush account, but instead she would pocket the money. Mo a lot of these checks were written to phony uh, were written to phony companies. She would take them, she would endorse them because it was such a small town, no one really questioned it, and she would move the money into her own account. Or sometimes she would just go and withdraw cash from that account, say she was going to pay a bill in cash. I, The more I think about this, the stupider it is how this was a even able to happen, but it did. And these invoices were bad. They had typos, they had incorrect logos. The state of Illinois, for the ones that were from the state, had the logo missing, the state crest missing. They were bad. But yet she got away with it. And because she was treasurer, she was also a, a legitimate payee for the state. So she just had it going all, all sorts of ways. And she wasn't shy about showing off her opulent wealth. She had 400 championship quarter horses. She bred them. She bought a $2 million Class A RV that had stainless steel appliances, granite countertops, five televisions. Now, I'm in an RV right now. It's nowhere near that kind of size. This is like a $15,000 RV. I don't see why you need five televisions and RVs when I'm trying to get to. That's just showing off for the sake of showing off. But it was like a huge tour bus style RV worth $2 million. She also had a ton of customized jewelry. She bought a huge ranch outside Dixon and had it had all the fences tailor-made, had RC all over everything for Rita Crunwell, bought trailers and trucks to transport her horses to various competitions, custom-made jewelry, custom-made outfits, custom furniture. She even invited the people from the city over to uh, her ranch for parties, and everybody's like, wow, they knew her $80,000 salary wasn't going to cover this kind of wealth. So everybody just assumed because her father had been in the horse business and she was in the horse business that she was making all her money from breeding horses, which it is a very profitable thing, but it's also very expensive. The care and uptake of 400 horses, vet bills, feed bills, training, it's a million dollar business. It's a million dollar intake, but it can also be a million dollar output as well. Remember that. She also bought a condo in Florida and another ranch out west. So she was living large. And all these audits, because she hung around with the accounting firm executives, she even dated one of them. Remember, this is after her divorce. All her audits came back clean, so no one was the wiser until 2012. This, actually 2011, this 
scandal and this ripoff of the city of Dixon went on for over 22 years. 2011, November 2011. That's when it all came crashing down. Kathy Swanson covers for Rita while she goes on vacation and to a horse competition, which was not unusual. Most people like employees to take vacations so that they can kind of spot check their work because somebody has to fill in for them. It's kind of a good practice. Well, Rita did go take trips and did take vacations, and Kathy Swanson, the city clerk, filled in for her. Well, it was the closing of which is another reason why would Rita Crunwell go away during such a vital time when the books were about to close for the year. So, Kathy, which this would normally have been done by Rita, Kathy was in charge of it, and to do it, she needed all their bank statements from the previous six months. And she asked Fifth Third for them. Fifth Third sent them over, and she did not recognize this reserve sewer capital development account, the RSCDA, she did not recognize as a legitimate city account. She started looking at the statements and saw all these huge transfers from other accounts into it and then them immediately leaving. She even saw where Rita was withdrawing cash. She knew immediately something was wrong. She took that statement to the mayor who immediately looked at it and called the FBI. The FBI looked at it and said there's definitely something going on here. Do not let her know that we're on to her. You have to keep quiet. Business is normal until we conclude this investigation. So for the next six months, from February, from, from November of 2011 to April of 2012, when they finally arrested her, the mayor and Kathy Swanson had to watch her, Rita Crunwell, steal another $3 million. The mayor even called the FBI at one time in uh, January and said, if you guys don't hurry, there's not going to be anything left for her to steal. So they rushed through it. Uh, in April of 2012, the FBI paid uh, the mayor a visit, asked to visit Miss Crunwell. He called her down to his office. He had Kathy Swanson in there as a witness. And uh, they just made some small talk. He said he was watching her very carefully to see her reaction to the FBI's questions. And she said he never showed any emotion. She never broke. She answered them calmly. And after the end of a two-hour conversation, they arrested her for the theft of millions of dollars from the city of Dixon. Kathy Swanson was quoted in an interview by the, uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, as saying that she felt vindicated when she saw the FBI agent step around behind Rita. At that point, Kathy said she closed her eyes. And when she heard the hand clips click shut she felt slightly vindicated at that point so it was kind of a catharsis for her to hear that they took uh, rita away she immediately posted a forty five hundred dollar bond which with dixon's money i'm sure uh to get out of jail immediately the fbi froze all of her accounts uh, why didn't they freeze it before she got out of jail and eventually she agreed to plead guilty and she was convicted of stealing close to $54 million, $53.7 million from the city of Dixon over the last 22 years. She stole approximately $4.5 million every year. And she was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. The state also filed six counts against her, but that was later dropped because of the length of the, her federal sentence. So she kind of got out of that. But... She lost everything. All her assets were frozen. Her ranches, her condo, her RV, all her horses, her jewelry, her clothes, everything she owned was, was auctioned off at her ranch there in Dixon to recoup some of the city's money. And the FBI said they had a reason for holding this auction in Dixon. They wanted people from out of state, out of the country to come in for this uh, horse auction and this RV, you know, this auction of the RV and all this stuff. They knew a lot of people would be coming in out of town because it's a curiosity. It's the largest municipal financial fraud in the history of the country. So a lot of people are going to come out of morbid curiosity. So they knew all those people would come into the city. They would stay in hotels. They would eat in the restaurants. They would give these people an added boost to the revenue as they tried to recover all this money. And at the end of everything, 
they were able to recover just over $12 million from the sale of her assets. Also, the royalties that Rita Cronwell still gets to this day, about $13,000 a year off of her horses and their progeny and their wins, all of that's immediately seized and also sent back to Dixon. So, in addition, the mayor was not done. He filed a lawsuit against Fifth Third Bank. Clifton Curtis and Sam Carr, the accountants, trying for um, misappropriation of the accounts. And they settled, all three of the entities settled with him, settled with the city of Dixon, out of court for close to $40 million, even though they admitted no wrongdoing. And there's been a lot of speculation that the only reason Clifton Curtis settled is because they knew that it would come out how closely entwined their executives were with Rita, and it would probably lead them to going out of business. Remember what happened with Enron and their Arthur Anderson? They didn't want another repeat of Arthur Anderson, so they agreed to settle. So all in all, with the royalties and everything, Dixon recovered almost every cent. And uh, the mayor quoted, as soon as she was gone, within a quarter, that's you know, within a quarter, Financial quarter, they noticed an uptick of $3 million in the budget. So the city of Dixon was uh, kind of brought back from this, luckily, because of the spontaneity of a mayor who would not give up. He could have just given up and said, well, we got $12 million back and we'll get a royalties. We'll eventually, no, he went after the people he knew were at fault and he got it all back. So good to him. Uh, he actually retired from the city of Dixon in 2014 after serving 14 years as mayor. Kathy Swanson also retired in 2016 after serving 25 years uh, with the city. Both of them are regarded local heroes. And Rita sits uh, in the Federal Correction Institution in Peking, Illinois, to this day. She's Her release, release date is slated for 2030. So far, all of her paroles have been denied, but we'll see where this goes. And there you have it, the largest municipal fraud in the history of the United States, $54 million. Gone in a very simple little scandal. Uh, and since then, Dixon has implemented changes. Uh, they have The treasurer is always a separate person from the comptroller. They have two or three different accountants handling their books. One handles the audit, one handles the taxes, and then uh, employees are not allowed to get their personal books done by any of those um, accountants, and they have accounts at three different banks, so this never happens with multiple signees, and at last their mayor is full-time, so at least there's some oversight there, so a lot of good changes came about, but if they had not trusted her so fully or trusted her and verified, this would never have happened. They should have taken Ronald Reagan's advice. But anyway, guys, that's the story of Dixon, Illinois, and Rita Cronwell. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Katosis, y'all. Keto Comic. Out.